Hello everyone, I'm Thomas Hall, Executive Director of Clean Start. We do have some seats up here in case if any of you in the back want to come forward and be within breathing distance of the speakers. Um, now first I want to make sure that we, especially with, uh, turn this on, um, first I want to make sure that we thank our sponsors, the people that enable us to have this meetup, Blue Tech Valley, Sac State, SMUD, um, the EY crew which showed up in force, thank you very much for coming today, Weintraub. They're sponsoring um, us just to get the free food, we want to make that very clear. Yes, <laughs> big four and they come for free food. Uh, 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 GT Law, Stoll Reeves, Moss Adams. Um, with all of them we're able to put on these and offer other programs to startups in the area. Now, some announcements of what's happening. Um, we have, supposed to be May 3rd, we get to critique Thomas's proofreading ability during these. That's a, a typical thing. We have the CEO crash course that, we'll put, that we're putting on with Blue Tech Valley. We have Future of the Utilities happening on May 7th. Um, and then how many of you like trivia? Clean tech, sustainability trivia. Well, the, the, the few of you that raised your hands, um, I put on green drinks in Sacramento at Big Stump Brewery, and we have trivia around sustainability there. It's a great place to come and test your knowledge. And they got plenty of beer there, Carol. Yes, they do. <laughs> they do. Um, we have Startup Legal Advice with GT Law on May 21st. And a big thing, Startup Weekend, Sustainability Edition, June 21st. Now I want, so how many of you are signed up for the newsletter? Make sure, you, make sure you stay signed up with the newsletter so you can connect. All right, so you might have said, OK, I rushed through those announcements really quick. But here's some detail about um, the CEO crash course. It's three days over May, um, 1 to 6 p.m. every Friday. Learn to run your, your startup like a CEO. Um, get the fundraising experience that you need. Get the marketing background office, um, back office experience. The ability to kind of pretty much everything. It's a crash course. Um, so this is put on by one of the leading professors of entrepreneurship on the West Coast, Dan Woodwani. Um, so he's at the Everhart School of Business, University of Pacific. Beautiful campus, beautiful room. Mm -hmm. So it'll be a very good course. So um, we have little things up around where you can look at that more. Uh, make sure you go, if you have a startup to go and apply because um, it starts next week. Oh, also, it's free. So remember that. You have to put a $200 deposit down. That's just to make sure you show up. But you get it back if you come to all three sessions. All right. So how many of you know what Startup Weekend is? No There's question. a few of you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Laura, good. Definitely know that. So Startup Weekend is a weekend where you come and you start the weekend by pitching your idea. And everyone leaves the weekend being part of a team that came together to make a business. Now, we're putting on a Startup Weekend the, uh, June 21st. And this Startup, revolution, uh, startup Weekend is around the revolution, the sustainability revolution. Who here thinks there's problems with emissions? Who here thinks there's problems with um, so global warming? We're all here because we see problems and we see solutions in these problems. Startup Weekend is 54 hours to bring a problem that you see a solution to, pitch it, become the lead of a team, join another team, and take it through the weekend and then pitch to a global audience. Get, get feedback, <coughs> get suggestions, refine the idea. It's a hackathon, mm -hmm. but on sustainability startups. So uh, it's fairly intensive, but it's a lot of fun too. Oh yeah. Um, how, uh, Kevin, who just went through it, how do you feel about it? It was, it was, awesome. it was a profound experience. It was really amazing. It, I'd say I'd encourage anyone to go. Um, if you don't have an idea, your skill and expertise would be, could be used for somebody else's idea. Mm -hmm. And you'll learn a lot about yourself and uh, how to start a business. There's, yeah. It's a hackathon, but not in, with code. It's a hackathon with business and ideas and customers and markets. So. so if you do modeling and you want to join a team where it's like, hey, I can help you model your product. If you have a background, whether it's in accounting or law and just know how to set up a business, that can help the people too. If you're engineering, marketing, jack of all trades, this is a place where you can get involved and join the sustainability revolution. It's June 21st, it's a full weekend. College students, remember that you get fed at this event, so it's well worth it. Um, and it's at Upcycle Pop, 
which is at 7300 uh, 7, Folsom Boulevard in Sacramento. And if you know what that is, that's an artist co-op that spins, that basically upcycles everything into new products. So the entire place is made up of upcycled tables, pretty much everything. Yes. It doesn't have to be a tech idea, even though we're, yeah. we're Clean Start and we're focused on clean tech. There was a list that we posted on the Clean Start page and on the Startup Weekend page about like the top 10 problems impacting uh, sustainability. Mm -hmm. And one of them was actually education of young women uh, and access to birth control. So it's, it's why. Uh oh, cut the funding for that. Yeah. No. <laughs> and um, if I you didn't. Say, regarding how you get pregnant. <laughs> so if, if, you're, if you want to do some quick trivia right now, by increasing um, family planning and education to women, how, many, how much greenhouse gases can be sold, saved every year? There's a recent report that came out on this. 120, um, I think, million tons? 120 million tons. It would be the third most effective thing that you can do to reduce greenhouse gases in the world. So not all the ideas are putting solar on the roof, sorry all the solar people here, or doing great storage, sorry all the storage people here, but it's also at, um, community engagement and making people change their life so that they can participate in this economy. I could talk forever on this, I won't though. Um, but it might, be, it, might, <laughs> it might be a global weekend, but everyone that comes out of it, I wanna eventually add them to the 2020 Clean Start Progress Report. I see some of you have the progress report, it came out last month. Make sure to pick up a copy of it. It's a review of clean tech in Sacramento over the past year. It has a great lit map on the back of all the clean tech companies. You can see ones in there like Spin, or Empower, or Solar Roof Dynamic. Um, I think Blue Oak's in there too. So, also Repurpose? Yeah. Repurpose is in there. Yeah, all right. Yeah, so it's, it's a cool report to have. Sign up for our newsletter, check out our blogs, know what's happening. Now tonight, we've got three awesome speakers for you. From Repower YOLO, we have Chris Sonderquist. I got here early and he started regaling me with stories about Clean Start before I was here. When, um, back in the day when Ben Finkelor still had all his hair. Actually he does, I still think. So maybe not that long ago. I had more hair. Um, and it was, a, it was a fun thing to listen to. Also later tonight we'll have Jay Wan Park from Repurpose Energy come and talk. They're participating in the Big Bang right now. They're recycling um, Nissan Leaf batteries. So if you're ever wondering what they're gonna do with all these um, used batteries, Jay Wan Park's working on a solution. And then we have Danny Lee, who's gonna be our first presenter. Um, from Blue Oak Energy, who they recently came out of hibernation after some time. So I'm excited to hear about uh, what they're doing. All right, so I'd like to welcome Danny Lee up to come and talk. Thank you, Thomas. Thanks, Gary. Actually, it was all started about was it two weeks ago, Gary. Gary stopped by the office and... I got lost, so I just stumbled, <laughs> he stopped, stumbled in. But I think he told me that you met with Tobin, our founder, back in 2004. Five -ish, yeah, we did the profile yeah. back then when he was just getting started. Yeah, so, so Blue Oak Energy's been around for a pretty long time in, in what we call solar years. Uh, and so <laughs> I've, been, I've been there since 2006, so almost 13 years is a long time for any. I see Aaron nodding, and, <laughs> and I'm sure Chris and John as well. But um, So Blue Oak Energy started uh, with, with the founder, Tobin Booth, a local guy. He moved up from North Carolina to Seattle, I came with his wife to Davis who started grad school and he started a solar company in Davis. Um, they called him Tofubin in, in uh, North Carolina because he was one of those few guys that thought about um, renewables and, and sustainability in, in North Carolina even in those early days. Although North Carolina has a ton of solar now but not when he was growing up. So when he came to Davis, um, he started up doing kind of like what Chris does, a lot of residential and small projects, um, but he saw an, a gap in engineering for solar. A lot of uh, developers and uh, at the time, there's a handful, uh, Sun Edison, BP Solar, you might remember those names, um, and they always go to a local engineering firm uh, that does houses and 
and buildings. Uh, but Tobin wanted to create a firm that only does solar, that can help not just do the engineering plans, but make projects viable. So that's sort of how it all started. Um, again, I joined in 2006. I think I was employee number three, I think. Um, and we all started on this Google project in Mountain View, which is at the time, it was 1.6 megawatts. And it was one of the biggest projects in the, in the country at the time. Uh, flash forward now, uh, Gabe Molina, my project manager, he's working on a 500 megawatt project in Texas right now. And he's got 90% plans done today, tomorrow morning. So we've, we've come a long way in the past 15, uh, 13, 15 years. Um, I'll get through a few slides. You know, a, a lot of stuff I, you can find on the internet on, on our website. So I don't want to, I want to get to something I think might be interesting to the, to the community here. So we're a solar engineering firm. We, um, but we've gone through a bit of a, a, a evolution, if you will. I think Gary and Thomas was kind of uh, alluding to it. Um, you know, so again, we're an engineering firm. We do a variety of, we have all the engineering disciplines in house, civil, electrical, mechanical, energy modeling. Uh, we used to do construction. We do less of that now. We do more construction management and con construction services, as we say. Um, but we still do a lot of testing, commissioning, and, and what we call forensics and troubleshooting. Your plant isn't performing. We go out there and try to help figure it out. Um, and this is a slide that I, I you know, we, had, we used to have this sort of management slide. You know, we have the CEO and VP of finance, but this is what I replaced it with. This is what I call the 10-year slide. And Jaime Garcia, he was really, after Tobin, the first employee he had. And he's still with us today. He sits right next to me. And that guy has a lot of solar knowledge in that head of his. Um, and I, like I, said, I joined, and Ryan, and there's Gabe there in the middle, joined in 2008, I think, Gabe? 2000. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but it's, it's funny, like I said earlier, um, when we meet with clients uh, who've never heard of us, which still happens, you know, and we're, we're still a small firm in Davis, um, this tenure is what sells us. I mean, we, we do good work over the years, but. It's, it's this experience and having seen the breadth of projects, I think that sells, sells our work. Uh, here's a glimpse of our clients. We work with really three main client groups. We have the developer, in empower producer, and in, in, uh, investor owned utilities. Um, we worked for big ones like SoCal Edison, we work for some more of the uh, more private ones like Invenergy. Uh, other group of clients are large construction firms. Uh, we call them EPCs. General Contractors, uh, Mortensen, White Construction. Um, and these are firms that build projects for these guys over here, um, but we, we engineer the projects for them. And our last, uh, our last set of clients are what we call corporates. We, do, we have a handful of projects we direct for the owners. Um, since we step, we're stepping away from full turnkey installation, um, we're still doing construction management, but you know, we do less with this now. You know, we work more for these guys who work for these guys or those guys that work for these guys. So more of a subcontractor model. Uh, but this is really the heart of what I want to get to today in terms of our evolution. Um, you know, so we, we, we first, we were established in Davis, it's kind of the obvious things. We, we, when we got to the mid-span of the Google project, we were about five people. That's the, in the red here, that's how many people we had. Um, we grew some in 2008, started doing full turnkey installations with REI as our first customer. We did uh, seven REI stores, REI stores in California. So that was our first sort of catapult. Um, so Tobin, our founder, was good friends with Kevin Hagen at REI, the, one of the first person I met that was a corporate responsibility manager at REI. And we, it started out as, hey, Tobin, help us figure out w whether we should do solar or not. Um, we looked at 150 stores across the country um, and was the early days of looking at the, the SGIP, and there was incentives back then for solar, although modules were also like three bucks a watt. And uh, Dave, do you remember those days? <laughs> do you remember those days? <laughs> and, um, and, and that was the beginning of what we call the era, we, we started, we want to do the turnkey era, we call it, the installation era. In 2010, we looked at the first um, utility scale solar farm. This is a 37 megawatts done with BP Solar. Um, which is slowly coming back to solar, actually, uh, through BP Light Source. Um, that was when our team of probably around seven or eight, really, first dug into utility-scale solar, which is large substations, transformers, medium and high voltage, 
all of which we learned on the spot. No one knew it. We found a consultant out of Seattle called Lane and Coburn that helped us figure out how to do underground cabling for, for DC. And we worked with a civil firm out of Pennsylvania that was willing to help us figure out how to do civil engineering for a large solar plant that we can afford. Um, a solar flex rack, one of the first companies to supply racking as a turnkey. And again, not knowing how to engineer foundations, we all figured it out together. That was, a, the, that was when we were all just trying to figure it out. Um, um, 2011, we grew. We moved to a bigger space in Davis. Um, and we were at that point up to almost 45 people. And we were doing, we had, we had engineers, designers, accountants, construction managers, project managers, IT. Um, so we were, we, were, we were doing well. You know, we kept expanding the team, include more civil, more high voltage and, and medium voltage in-house. Um, and then we started doing more construction in 2014. So 2014 was roughly when Tobin, our founder, thought about exit strategy. You know, he had a personal goal to get to Seattle, Washington. And a lot of these startups, you know, this is sort of, I don't want to call it the dark side, but it was sort of the beginning of reality for me. Our startup world was changing. Um, he, there was, we started, the, he was starting to market Blue Oak Energy to potential buyers of all kinds. So our day to day, from a team of engineers trying to do good work and getting things done to pitches and helping Tobin sell the company. Um, and to me, honestly, that was very difficult for me because uh, I love Blue Oak Energy. I, I had no, we had, Tobin had a great stock option plan, but I had no stake in the company. I wanted to work. Um, and, and in this time, I've had roles from, I started out as a project engineer. I went to a project manager, I was VP of engineering. Around 2011, I took over business development and sales. When I, when I met David, started getting um, for full turnkey installations. Um, but then in 2015, Tobin did a partial, sold a, por a portion of the company to a group called Coronal Energy powered by Panasonic. So this is, Coronal Energy was a, um, uh, uh, a, an asset owner at the time. And they were backed by Panasonic. And they own about 15 sites across California. They also acquired a group called Heli Heliosage out of Charlottesville, Virginia, a greenfield developer. And they acquired us, Blue Oak Energy, to be the engineering construction arm. So their, their vision was an end-to-end -end solution for utility scale projects, period. <laughs> you know, and backed by a big Fortune 100, Panasonic. It all sounded fantastic and it all had great intentions. Um, and in this time, I got demoted. I was kicked over to Charlottesville. I reported to a young man named Andrew Fokel. He was a great guy, um, but we were shuffled. The whole, there was a lot of turnover. A lot of people left. And uh, it, was, it, was, it was difficult. Um, you know, good things happened. We all worked together. We, the Coronal Blue Oak Energy worked together on a 44 megawatt down in Tulare. Learned a lot. The first project our team sunk their teeth into. Um, 2017 was a full acquisition. And the exit of Tobin. Tobin retired. Sort of retired. He's out building cabins in Seattle right now and, and having a great time with his family, which he fully deserves. Again, this is... With a lot of things in life, there's no bad guys or good guys. It's just life. And I, I wish Tobin well. I talk to him every couple months, and he's still a big part of our, part of our friendship. You know? and, but then, then in 2018, the Coronal was for sale again. They wanted to sell Coronal Energy, the turnkey solution, to, other, to a larger, it's like it the fish eating the fish eating the fish. And, um, and we were even marketed to some large utilities as a turnkey uh, complete uh, uh, turnkey solution. That didn't work, you know, for a variety of reasons. I don't think it's any fault of Coronal. It was the market. Some tariffs you might know about, some tariffs, some ITC cliffs happening, uh, investment tax credit cliffs, and it didn't happen. Then in 2018, um, in December, I kind of inherited Blue Oak Energy again. So the, our, the owners of Coronal Energy said, um, Reset. Uh, Charlottesville went back to Greenfield Development. Colonel Group, Colonel Energy in Pasadena went back to their roots of asset, asset management ownership. And, and my boss, Jonathan Jaffrey, said, Danny, go figure out Blue Oak Energy again. Um, <laughs> whatever you can do, salvage it, figure what you're going to do. So the, I kind of wish there was that CEO um, 
<laughs> crash course because I kind of was thrown into that. Like I said, I started out as an engineer. I still am, although Gabe does all the real work now. Um, but then I did sales. And then and at the end of 2018, I was in charge of massive layoffs. I was in charge of figuring out accounting um, when our, um, one of our VP of finance left. Uh, me, myself, and Ryan Zayner, our VP of construction, was, was there to kind of pick up the pieces. You know, we were stripped of, of a lot of things. And, uh, but so again, but, it's, but when I met with Gary, I, I think I was in good spirits because I think I am happy now, finally. <laughs> You know, and, and with good friends, good people like Gabe on my side, we, we've clawed back to a team of 26 of dedicated engineers and construction service managers, project managers. Um, it's a simpler life again, you know. Uh, up in here, there's a lot of confusion. Um, but on a, on a more kind of company, uh, industry-wide, we're seeing a lot of deconsolidation. Uh, funny, one of our, my managers, I've had like six managers over the last three years, um, told me that there's a disintegration of companies, which is a very jargonistic way of saying disintegration. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but a, a DNVGL had a group called PV Evolution Labs. They split PV out of Berkeley. They're back on their own. So there is this mentality of doing what you're good at and just that. Don't try to grab too much of the pie. Um, so, and then, and then I guess as it ends now, we, we're moving to Sacramento to a new office, uh, a brand new start. Uh, we created the office in Atomas to have a, a very similar feel to Davis. We'll miss Davis greatly. I, I, I live here. I love Davis, but um, it's the right size for us. Um, got a frantic call from Sarah Worley, <laughs> and she was worried about that. <laughs> the property is police. What the hell? Yeah. <laughs> and, um, uh -huh. But yeah, so, here to defend yeah. <laughs> so I'm not sure how long I've gone. So that was a bit of a, you know, I took our, our standard sales presentation, stripped out 80% of the slides, and really just wanted to focus on this slide. Yeah, no, this, this is great. So yeah. you're cash flow positive or, or near that? Now. Near that, yeah. So you, so you did turn that around. Yeah. And Joe and Scott, what I heard is they need a good accounting firm. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> yeah. You need to connect up with them. Yeah. And you're, you're hiring again as you build the company. But it's, it's, good, it's slower. It's slower, yeah. It's, uh, it's slower. And, and not only do we go back from what we did with Corona, we're going, like I said, mentioned earlier, we're going back to early 2008. We're, we're more and more a pure engineering firm now. Um, we, we, we do construction services um, and help people do construction projects. And I still spec Canadian modules when I can for Dave. And, uh, but so we, it is different than before, which is more sustainable for us because I think construction is difficult. And, uh, and it's, it's, it's for, uh, maybe in a different presentation, the industry has changed a lot while we've been in it. Right? Mm -hmm. Aside from our change, industry has changed. There's a lot of players. Our subcontractors now can do turnkey installation. Mm -hmm. you know? And um, what was hard eight years ago isn't hard anymore. A lot of the engineering for smaller projects can be done by internal folks of a construction company. So we're focusing more on more of the complex jobs, the larger jobs, but really focusing on the consulting aspect of it. Yeah. Quick question for mm -hmm. you. So is the plan to essentially build the company back up to perhaps the 2011 growth level of 45 employees? We'll see. Um, again, as part of another presentation, maybe I, I don't. I think that growth was irresponsible. We were hiring engineers and project managers that had no place being at Blue Oak Energy, and I have good people like Gabe and others suffer through that while we figured it out. You know, because it takes time to get an engineer who understands the technical aspects of a company, respects keep the team around them, and can lead with the right integrity and the right um, kind of ethos of Blue Oak Energy. Uh, we hired lots of people over, the, over that time frame that, that, that weren't properly kind of brought up through our system. So maybe someday, but I think we'll be here for a while. Yeah. Yeah. Does Corona still own you? And can you talk a little bit about how you're trying to switch the culture back so that people don't feel like they're owned by Corona, some yeah. distant parent company? It's more of that startup feel again. Yeah, good question. I, in many ways, I report to CEO of Corona, and I'm, I'm I kind of run the Davis office with Ryan Zayner. Um, so, by and large, it's been um, we're only connected through our accounting system. You know, so we have our own sort of day-to-day. -day. 
Um, so we, we're really, we've really detached. Um, I don't know, Gabe, what do you think? How do you feel? Feel better? I know there's still some, there's still some issues, but... Um, Sorry, can you re repeat your question really quick? He was talking about the culture of getting sure. people to be excited to work for a startup yeah. or a small company. Yeah. That, that was perfect. Yeah, so I, I think at Blue Oak, we never lost our culture. And uh, thankfully, and or fortunately, our culture, everybody else that joined, you know, like uh, the Charlottesville guys and the Pasadena people, they would come to, to Davis and they would just love it. And they're literally trying to mimic what we did. And so in a sense, we didn't change. We just kind of kept trudging through that process. But um, but yeah, no, our, our culture is super strong. It's, uh, if anything, at this point with the smaller group has gotten stronger, we're tighter as a group and yeah, it's. I, I think the confusion that Danny, you know, spoke about earlier. I think that was what some people made some people uneasy, and I think it's you know pretty understandable. Um, and I, I'm not going to say that everybody that's completely gone, but I think that um, it's definitely a very very minor, if, if any, at this point. Um, so yeah, I think as far as culture and being blue oak, I think everybody is still, you know, we, we never stop being blue oak. Hmm. I had to remove the people that weren't blue oak. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why did you have to move out of Davis and do you think you'll lose that cultural thing that you have by changing location? That's a good question. I don't know for sure. I don't think so because I do think that uh, we have is, is more of the people. Davis is a great town. We have a lot of people who don't live in Davis anymore. Um, so uh, to be to be determined, but I think we'll be okay. I think it's up to the people to make it make it happen day to day. Once you once you all walk in that doors at 8 a.m., I think that's what we'll see. Um, sure, certainly, certainly be a lot of the other outside events. You know, we guys play soccer at lunch and and the biking to work be harder for some people, but. But yeah, I certainly hope not. But I'm, but I'm confident our, our people will hold together. You've yeah. connected with uh, Dave on Canadian Solar. Do you preferentially buy modules from Canadian Solar? What's that relationship? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's not preferential. I mean, I think what I, what I believe in loyalty. Um, in 2011, I had an order of three. 315 modules I needed for a project in Nevada. And, and because of certain limitations, it had to be 315s. Matthew Saunders changed an order and got me those modules. To me, I, I'll never forget that. Okay. And Dave has always been there to, on those. We've had some rough times over the years. They've always stood by us. So it's, it's preferential, but I think certain preferences are earned and not bought. Yeah. Thank you. yeah. Do you have a question? Yeah. Oh, okay. Ta -da. All right. Well, thank you very much, Danny. Yeah, thank you. So, thank you. Jim, thank you for coming. I don't know what you're doing here, why you want to listen to me. <laughs> and to my friends, Tom and Peter and, um, gosh, Ben Finklor, we helped kind of start Clean Start in our incubator. I was on the founding board of Sarda. I'm aging myself, but I'm an old yeah, man really. now, so I can say this stuff. Um, but thank you for coming to our, to our office um, and to our humble um, town of Davis. I appreciate it. I've, I've chased a lot of rainbows in my life to kind of amplify what Gary was saying, meaning um, in the past 28, 29 years, I haven't had a job that I've always run my own companies and most have failed. So I've lived in the gutter a lot. <laughs> a couple of them have done okay. And um, I, not to sound overly sappy or trite, but um, I am more content, more fulfilled, and also just more buried, frankly, than I've ever been in building our current business. Um, I asked Thomas, Thomas showed up about 4 or 4.30, and I said, do I need to give a presentation? He's like, yeah. And I said, how long do I have? So you can tell I've done no preparation. And he said, you got 20 minutes. And I said, seriously? And he's like, yeah, the guys that don't do PowerPoints, they bomb. And I'm like, <laughs> all right, PowerPoint, here we go. 
So I'm going to focus mostly on kind of my wounds or my experiences in starting companies. And therein, hopefully I'll add a little bit about the solar industry and our experience in building this company. One thing that I will say about our company, um, our technical name is New Energy Assets LLC. The DBA is Repower. Repower is our residential program. We do um, itty bitty small solar. And so we aspire to be Gabe and Danny at some point. But we've done, we're responsible for about 12,000 solar panels in the community, about 250 homes, a couple dozen residential, pro I'm sorry, a couple dozen commercial projects, hotels, places like that. By design, we are hyper-local in that when I have the fortune of speaking to the GSM or to the Sac State Business School or the Entrepreneurship Academy, and somebody will say, hey, fathead, what's your exit strategy? And I'll be like, exit strategy, that like brings me back 20 years ago. And it's like, have fun, work hard, and make money. And it's not, we're not seeking to expand throughout Northern California or the rest of California. I strongly believe that the more focused you are in terms of what you do and where you do it and for whom, the more referenceable you are. And if you think of a market as a pond or a bathtub, every time you drop a pebble, meaning every time you get a client, there's a ripple effect. The smaller the pond is, the tighter the geography is, presuming that you know what the hell you're doing, you do a good job, then it becomes easier when you drop your second pebble or your third pebble or your fourth pebble. So think of your markets as ponds. It's great to chase rainbows. I've spent a lot of time and a lot of money and had a lot of fun doing it. But we're not gonna talk about rainbows tonight. So um, one of my favorite quotes, my wife hates this quote, but um, <laughs> To me, entrepreneurship is an art, it's not a science. If it was a science, we could all open up a book and figure out what to do. But no two businesses are the same, no two circumstances are the same, it's an art. And if you don't love it, don't do it. Any Yoda fans out there? Um, just do it. That I, if I found two reasons why um, people have failed in the, I mean, Gary and I have seen probably thousands of startup companies um, between us. Um, I believe number one, it's a lack of focus. I'm gonna talk about that later. Um, and number two, um, it's a lack of a competitive nature. If you want to start a company or if you're running a business and if you're not competitive, if you don't get pissed off if somebody screws you out of a couple thousand dollars and you just say, ah, that's life, whatever, go get another job, I meaning get a job. If you are not competitive, you're cheating yourself, you're cheating your family, everybody else. So thank you, Yoda. Um, so I, does anybody know Fleet Feet running store? So Sally Edwards, anybody know Sally by chance? Sally started Fleet Feet 30, 35 years ago in Victorian in Sacramento. Um, sorry, 26 in J in Sacramento. And Sally was one of my mentors. One of the things I'm very fortunate is I grew up with a lot of very smart ass kicking people and Sally and I, her business meeting was, we'd go run the bluffs around Lake Natoma. Sally was 50, I was 30, and we'd sprint up these 200, 300 foot bluffs with our heart rate monitors on, and this is 20 years ago, and Sally would kick my ass every time. One of the things I learned from Sally is that she's like, you know what, and everything that she did was around fitness, hearts, and empowering women. She was the first ever athlete, female athlete, that was um, endorsed by Nike. She won the first triathlon. She done all this great stuff. Sacramento um, lady. She said, you gotta have fun and you gotta make money. And then you smile. And I'm like, cool, Sally. All right, that's, that's easy enough. And then Sally and I started talking more. And we, she didn't draw a Venn diagram for me, but she um, orated this to me. She said, you know what? If you look at it, the, happy, the key to happiness and the key to making money is the intersection between three things that if you're an artist, and there's nothing wrong with being an artist, um, that you have a skill and you have an interest but it does not intersect with the market, you can't make money or it's very difficult to. Um, 80, 90% of the people that I know, they've got the skills to do something and someone will pay them. But they don't give a shit about it. They don't like what they're doing. There's no interest or passion there. Those that I think have the most fulfilling time, whether they are employed or they are the employer, are those that can find the intersection between these three. And, I'm sorry, that's my smiley face. <laughs> my emoji, or like fake PowerPoint emoji. So then, I, 
as I got older and I lost more hair and um, my wife, you know, got sicker and sicker of me, you know, failing and starting companies, I thought, what if you could combine your skills, your interests, a market opportunity, because everyone's got to make a living, right? I got to pay rent for this place and send my kids to college. What if you could do good too? And sorry, Laura, apologies for stealing your surname, but what if we could do good too? And our company, Repower, that um, we aren't saints, um, but every time we help somebody go solar. So today I had an 88 year old um, man who lives in East Davis, who used to run the psychology department at UC Davis, who signed a contract to go solar. And he wasn't like the young 30 or 40 year olds that go on and shop via home advisor and get 10 bids and all of that. Um, they're all just really making the decision based upon price. He looked me in the eye and he said, I don't got much more time on this planet, young man. And I said, yeah. He said, but I want to make a difference. Can I trust you? And he put his hand out to me. This is on Regis Drive in East Davis. And I said, yes, sir. You know, then trust me. And he made a decision. He's 88. He's going solar. And I thought, that is really fucking cool. <laughs> this is awesome. <laughs> this is really good. That made my day. And so my company, you make a thousand or two thousand dollars, you know, maybe I can buy my wife dinner. But that was really, really fun. We also, every time somebody goes solar, we've helped, as I said, about 250 homeowners locally go solar. We donate $500 to the local nonprofit of their choice. We don't have to, but it is, um, we're not benevolent saints, but it is a de facto form of marketing in that we don't employ salespeople, we don't buy leads, we do not advertise, we do not market, but instead, we hope the goodwill. If you do good work and you support local organizations, to date, we have um, 58 organizations we've donated money to. So that's called Yellow Shines. It's really fun. Anybody that has a business, I really encourage you to do that. Give back to your community, institutionalize a program. It's cool. All right, everyone pull out your phone. Oh, I'm sorry, anybody that is running a business or is considering starting a business, pull out your phone, please. This is gonna take like 30 seconds. And you can give me two fingers in the air if you want. <laughs> um, so simply type this out, send yourself an email. So to Chris, I don't know if anybody else does this, like if I need to buy milk or pick up something for my son, I, either wrote, I used to write on my hand, but now I send myself an email or set a calendar alert. So we, meaning your company, what do you do to help whom accomplish what? Write this down, think about it, refine it, refine it, refine it. And if you can't answer this, get out, go do something else. If your answer is very vague, we help consumers or we reduce energy use to help consumers reduce their PG&E bills. Like, wow, great, what the hell do you do? Who is it specifically that you solve a problem for? And pin that on your wall, pin it on your Instagram, pin it wherever. And then answer the question of we win because. Why is it that we win? Don't bullshit yourself. Do not smoke your own dope, eat your own dog food, drink your own Kool-Aid, any of that. You can smoke dope all you want. I'm cool with that. But don't lie to yourself. Why is it that we win? For whom? Make sure that you're really focused on that. If you're not focused on that, if you can't answer it, do not start a company. Certainly do not raise money from other people because if so, you're not only fooling yourself and the people that work with you, but anybody that you've entrusted. They've entrusted you as their fiduciaries. So I, um, does anybody know the Sacramento Entrepreneurship Academy? Does that ring a bell? Okay, does anyone know Dusty Baker? By the way, the Sacramento kid, uh, managed the Giants. Um, I think it's the fifth or sixth. Uh, no, I'm sorry, sixth or seventh. Um, we, every year for the Entrepreneurship Academy, I've been on the board for years. We have an annual showcase event, Sac State, UC Davis undergrads. They write business plans. They present them to the Sacramento business community. Um, one year when I was president of the nonprofit, I had the fortune, I cold called Mark Cuban, the owner of the Dallas Mavericks. And this is before he was on Shark Tank and doing other stuff. Uh, so 10, 12 Maloof years in King's era. And I got him to come speak to be our showcase speaker. And we're sitting at the firehouse one day 
or the day of the event for lunch and it's with the students from Sac State and UC Davis and some other fatheads like me. And I turned to him, he's a big guy. You know, I'm a little guy, he's like 6'4", 220, he's in good shape. I'm like, Mr. Cuban, why do you do this? What makes you tick? Because he was starting, he started broadcast.com, sold it I think to Yahoo, and then he bought the Mavericks and he's starting a bunch of companies. And he paused and he looks up at this mural. If you've ever been, Firehouse, have you guys been downstairs in the atrium? It's a beautiful painting. And he looks up and it's this, probably five seconds, it felt like two minutes. And he pauses and he looks at me and he looks at the students and he said, I like to fuck with people. And all of us are like, whoa, <laughs> dude, you're a billionaire. Yeah, 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 we get it. And we're like, elaborate, you're Mr. Cuban, what do you mean? And he said, I like it when I find situations where industries are behind in their thinking and I can apply new thinking to something and it's not about capital. He said, that makes me tick. So fast forward, Dusty Baker, like Mark Cuban, is speaking. Anybody who can attend, please do. It might be sold out. So these are 10 thoughts for the crazies. Crazies to me are my lovable brethren, anybody that um, never grows up like me and doesn't want to get a job, but anyone that is involved with startup companies, here are things I recommend. There's a great line, um, gosh, I should remember who said this, but making the simple complicated is commonplace. Making the complicated simple, awesomely simple, that's creativity. And a big challenge when you are starting a business or trying to sell something is not only understanding who you're, who you're doing something for and what your focus is, but taking something, presuming that your value proposi proposition is, this is screwed up, and making it awesomely simple. So make the simple complicated, almost everyone else makes the, I'm sorry, make the complicated simple, almost everyone makes the simple complicated. Um, it's very easy, I was talking about, you know, eating your own dog food, smoking your own dope. It's very easy to navel gaze and to say, huh, here's what we think. And it's very easy to sell yourself on something, especially if you're an entrepreneur. But you're never gonna learn anything unless you go out there and actually talk to the markets. And furthermore, markets are conversations. When I was talking about dropping pebbles within a bathtub or a pond, markets are conversations. And if you ever lose that conversational part, or if you're ever scared to converse, then you're hurting yourself. But the flip side of it, relationships are not transactions. That a couple of years ago, there was somebody in the solar industry that screwed me out of $5,000. And I say me because I own my business. And this person was a fairy. He decided to do it. It was his call. You can do whatever you want. You know, you move on. We all grow up. You compete harder the next day. But relationships are not transactions. And if you ever view, or if anybody on your team is viewing a relationship as being transactional, then I don't think that's the right way to do it. Um, bigger is not better is another way of saying the size doesn't matter. And I don't say that just because I am, you know, 5'8 on my tiptoes. Um, but I truly believe through focus that unfortunately with startup companies, they're focused on dominating the world, which is great from an aspirational standpoint. It's great to write a book about. But realistically, the companies that work, in my opinion, are those that have a, again, hyper-local or a very, very intense market segmentation that they're focusing on. What can you be the best at for home? And then drill down on that. It's not a matter of being the biggest. Um, Peter Drucker, who's a, a great late marketing professor at Harvard, had this great definition of marketing. He said, marketing is simply define a need and fill it. And I'm like, man, that guy's awesome. Very cool. I read a bunch of Drucker's books back when I was in business school a long time ago. Um, the point here is that anybody, no matter what you're selling, if you're selling professional services for EY, or you're selling energy storage, or you're selling Canadian solar kick-ass modules, um, wherever you're doing it, you're not selling the actual drill. It ain't the solar module, it ain't the energy storage, and it ain't the consulting services. You're selling the outcome. And the better you understand the outcome, the hole that your drill is drilling, the more likely you are to succeed. Especially those in technology, we focus on selling just 
bitchin' kick-ass drills. It's the best in the world. But it's the hold of marriage. They're not buying the drill to buy the drill. They're buying it because they want to accomplish something. Sell holes. Does anyone know, remember the band Sticks? Dan Cullen, you gotta remember Sticks, right? right? Gary, all right. So they had a song, one of their lyrics was, inch wide, a mile deep. Um, if I had one message to convey, it would be that of focus. And when you identify what it is that you enjoy doing, that you're good at, um, where you can make money, find out what that one inch hole is and drill as fast as you can a mile deep. If you are reactive to a market, as people say, hey, can you do this too? Or what about this? Or what about that? The more holes that you drill, the less likely you are to succeed and the more frustrating it's gonna be. You can always drill another mile deep hole a year later or five years later. But if you don't focus on this, and if you're distracted, if you're chasing after squirrels like my <laughs> yellow lab is, then I think you are cheating yourself. Um, I'm not a religious guy, but we got two ears and one mouth. And it's taken me a long time to understand this. But this is not only listening to markets and customers and all of that, but listen, listen, listen. You know, open your mouth. There's a reason why you only have one. Um, one of the, not the most trite, but one of the phrases in business school, and if you pick up anything else, is first mover advantage. And like I, Tesla's one of my favorite companies in the world. Tesla has a first mover advantage in that they've built out the network of um, supercharger stations. Any of the auto manufacturers could drop in at any point. Why they haven't, I... Maybe they've all got room temperature IQs or they're sitting on their thumbs. I don't know. But geographically, they have um, dealerships that are dispersed. So you think, I mean, every 20, 30, 50 miles in the United States, you could find a Toyota or a Ford or a Mercedes or a VW dealership. Why is it they haven't built out charger networks? Now, I'm not going to answer that question or I'm sorry, I'm not posing it as a question. But Tesla's got a little bit of an advantage. But our little business that was started with $5,000, and that was our only capital contribution for me and my partner, John. Um, we've moved like uh, 2,222nd into the solar market. I love it. What Sunrun does, what SunPower does, what Tesla Solar City, even though they're dying on the vine, what any of the national companies do. I love it when I receive a direct mailer or I get a cold call from a solar company. And I thank them. I'm like, this is awesome. Thank you very much. I want to hear about your solar because they are creating awareness. And I love to go head to head against the big companies because I'm not being arrogant, but we kick their ass 80 or 90% of the time. So let the big boys create awareness. Come in. It's cool to move second. Above all, and this is kind of inch wide, mile deep, um, there's nothing wrong with being a simpleton. And I am... Not ashamed to say I am a solar simpleton <laughs> and I love it. But whatever it is that you do, don't try to be, if you have kind of stars in your eyes, you think, oh my gosh, I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that. I think great gratification and great rewards will come if you're a simpleton. Last but not least, share. And I, I say this not just with YOLO shines and giving back to the community, but I am very fortunate to, um, I sit on three or four nonprofit boards and I used to, um, people were nice enough to invite me to be on boards like SARTA and work with other groups. Um, these groups are now trying to feed the hungry and trying to house the homeless and trying to reduce climate change. If you all, if you have any experience or any interest applying the abilities of running a business or starting a company to a nonprofit organization that has a very clear mission or purpose, but they need help as a fiduciary, they need help raising money, they need help communicating. That gratification is greater than anything. And I spend about 15 hours a week as a volunteer, working at the soup kitchen, working at the shelter, working on climate change, all that. So I encourage you to uh, do the same. So with that, thank you very much. Oh, thank much. you. This can't be the first you. time you've given it. What's it? Well, I just threw the slides again. <laughs> yeah, so uh, 
I'm Chewan Park. I'm a professor at uh, UC Davis and also a CEO and founder of Repurpose Energy. Uh, today, I just want to introduce you to uh, Second Life uh, electric car batteries for uh, energy storage system. This has been my research for the last 10 years, 11 years now. Um, so, me and my student actually started, started a startup company last year and uh, has, have been struggling <laughs> to make progress. So uh, the good news is that yesterday, so we, uh, we kind of participated, we competed in, uh, what is that, the Great Ideas Competition, which is hosted by UC Berkeley. There were 365 teams competing. And it was a, yesterday was the last day for seven top teams for final pitching and we won the competition. I, I am extremely proud of my team members. So, uh, but today I, I'm not gonna talk about my company. Uh, I will talk about the technology and why we have to do this. Why this is beneficial for our uh, society. Yeah. And that's what I'm doing. So this is actually the presentation file I made it for my class. So, I just skip, you know, environmental impact thing. You know, we all know what this means. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, here, this is our real problem. You probably have seen this. Looks like a dock, but this is actually a net demand of the day uh, uh, for our like greed. So, greed net demand decreasing a lot, uh, especially during daytime because of a lot of solar. So California actually committed 100% renewable electricity by 2045. So already we have installed a lot of solar panel. The solar panel, as you know, produces electricity only during daytime. So as soon as sunset now, what is the solar power? It's like zero, right? But, why, but we actually use a lot of electricity. So net demand increases substantially during evening time. So this has become a real, real big problem for us. So uh, to prevent this, to relieve this problem, we have to install energy storage. So there are many different kinds of energy, st energy storages out there, but they are still very expensive. The batteries probably have the best efficiency, highest efficiency, and wor works well, proven technology, but it's expensive. So uh, my idea was very simple. You know, uh, I came to UC Davis in 2008 summer, and at the time there was no electric car. Honestly. I had a very small neighborhood electric car, just like a golf cart, but it only had a 10 miles of driving range. It had a lead acid batteries. But I know that companies like Tesla just announced their uh, first sports car, right? and I knew that companies planning to sell their electric cars. So, but electric car, uh, electric cars have pretty large battery pack. Uh, Nissan Leaf, for example, has a 24 kilowatt hour lithium ion battery pack. But after, you know, about like five years, it depends on how you drive, uh, they lose, they gradually degrade and lose capacity. So after they lose about 25% of initial capacity, they're not good enough anymore. 25% of uh, initial capacity means that you lose about 25% driving range. Tesla Model S has 300 miles of like driving range per, per charge. But after you lose 25%, that means it's about 220 miles, which is not really good. So it depends on the drivers and owners. Uh, after losing 25 to 30% of, of their initial capacity, most of, the, most of the electric car batteries, they retire. So, what would you do with that? The reality nowadays is that 95% of retired batteries are actually buried underground. You know, we have to recycle it, but recycling cost is so high. We can, get, we can retrieve some precious metals like cobalt, nickel, and lithium from it, but the recycling cost is about three times more expensive than the, you know, the worth of those precious metals. So, you know, we just bury it. <laughs> So why do we have to bury that? They have 75% still lifetime capacity left over. Let's use it, let's repurpose it uh, for 
energy storage system, which we really need. So that was my idea, so simple. So um, I'm comparing the new batteries and second life batteries. So new co the cost of the batteries as an actually, uh, this is actually the, about one year ago, but the new battery cost now is about $200, $250-ish per kilowatt hour. The second life batteries now we, uh, we pay about $45 per kilowatt hour. So it's about one fourth, one third of the cost. And their lifetime though is shorter obviously. So we expect, you know, maybe the maximum lifetime will be about 10 years. The new batteries will last about 15 years. And the efficiency is surprisingly is very similar. Even though 25% degraded batteries still has about like 90 to 94% cyclic efficiency. So when, while the new batteries have, you know, a few percent higher, probably one or two percent higher. So as a, for energy storage, this efficiency is high enough. And uh, other costs, yeah, depend. So uh, I came to UC Davis in 2008 and I got my first small grant in 2010 to build a uh, off-grid uh, electric vehicle charger using second life batteries. So at the time there's no second life batteries actually exist because no electric, electric cars just debuted, you know, none of them actually retired. So what I bought, what I found is that I found some um, used batteries for Prius plug-in conversion. So these batteries were used in, in uh, uh, Prius for about four or five years and they lost some capacity. They kind of retired from the car. I could find these batteries on eBay. So we bought it and built a uh, 10 kilowatt hour, 10 kilowatt hour, uh, uh, 12 kilowatt hour uh, energy storage system for a house. Actually, at, at the beginning it was a uh, off-grid electric vehicle charger, but we converted it into a uh, kind of grid connected energy storage system later. So what it does is very simple. The, the storage was actually installed in this house. This house is an Aggie house. It's kind of close to campus. Uh, it's, it's a about 1600 you know, square foot house that has a, about 2.5 kilowatt solar panel on the rooftop. So there were uh, two tenants living in the house. They didn't really use much electricity. So these solar panels during daytime overproduced electricity. They this producing that was producing more than they needed. So uh, they you know send it back, send the electric electricity back to the grid at very low you know rate. And you know when they come home, they start to use electricity. There was no solar energy, so that was not really good. So what we did is very simple. We just charge the electricity, electricity during daytime and discharge it during evening time. So this was, the system was demonstrated in uh, 2012, 13, 11, 12, 13, about two and a half years. Uh, what it did is a, yeah, the red colors is showing a uh, solar generation and the blue color is load. So, and then these solid lines are indicating uh, grid uh, price, electricity price. So here now, you know, everywhere, pretty much everywhere in California has a time of use plan. That means a, you are actually uh, pay different rate depending on the hour, right? So the peak time now is 4 to 9 p.m. So at the time it was a little different. So uh, yeah, so to save electricity bill, for example, you, you can even charge this battery pack during nighttime. So when the electricity call rate is lowest and discharge it during evening time. So that will be very beneficial for you or to reduce uh, uh, grid, you know, peak demand. We can charge the batteries during daytime and discharge it during evening peak time. So these batteries can do a lot of different job. Uh, but basically the fundamental goal is kind of peak shifting. We want to reduce uh, peak time electricity use as much as possible. So uh, that was my first project and then I got a few other grants uh, and then eventually in 2015 I got kind of big grant from California Energy Commission with the same idea. So uh, we plan to build a much bigger system which is uh, it's actually 300 kilowatt hour system. Um, using about 20 Nissan Leaf batteries. 
So Nissan Leaf batteries, yeah, it was originally 24 kilowatt hour. Then uh, we received uh, about 19, yeah, 19 Leaf battery packs from Nissan. Thankfully, they donated everything for free, including even shipping costs. <laughs> so uh, we, yeah, repurpose them uh, for this uh, as an energy storage system. So basically, same idea, but it's much bigger system and much more powerful. So this system eventually, you know, we it oh, it took about two years. We completed the system development and installed it at the uh, one of the campus building, which is a Robert Mondavi Institute. I have the picture. Yeah, this is a picture from the from the air. So. Uh, the system is now beside this water tank uh, serving and we also install more solar panel here. So the total solar panel there is about 220 kilowatts and our storage is about 300 kilowatt hour. So what we do is a, yeah, it's the same thing. This building during daytime, they overproduce electricity and evening time, yeah, not no solar. So we store the electric, solar electricity and discharge it during peak time. So it looks like this. Um, we use, you know, this is actually the computer server rack and server case, and we put the leaf batteries inside, connect them to a battery management system, an energy management system, and eventually put everything inside the shipping container. So I think I have the picture here. Oh, no, sorry, that, okay. So we put everything inside the uh, 20 feet shipping container and um, with uh, some thermal management system and energy management system, BMS together. Uh, so it's like a turnkey system. We can even move that thing to any other place. If you need 300 kilowatt hour system, just you know, bring your trailer <laughs> and bring it there, just plug it, then it will work. So uh, I think it was really you know, good idea and people really liked it. And it's the good thing, good thing about this is uh, it's obviously much cheaper compared to new system, even consi considering lower, uh, shorter lifetime. So dollar per kilowatt hour per year, still much cheaper than uh, energy storage system using new batteries. So I think we can probably commercialize this idea. Um, so that was, you know, the, the effort uh, we actually started last year. So uh, <coughs> I'm going to show you just a few pages for my uh, company, if it's OK. Yeah. Can you open up the next one? There's mouse up there. The mouse up there. <laughs> yeah, I think time's already passed. Just want to introduce you uh, very briefly uh, to my company. Yeah, so my company, uh, yeah, this is a brief timeline. We started, uh, first developed the things in 2009 and our financial product. So my company, our strength is a, okay, so we've done about 10 years of research on batteries. We use batteries, but you know, when you use Second Life kind of used batteries, one of the biggest problem is a, they are randomly degraded. Some are like very new, like 95% you know, SOH. Some are like 50% SOH. You cannot use them together. So when you, we have limited kind of allowed state of health variation. Um, so even, even we have like, you know, similar uh, state of health variations, we still have to be very careful to manage them. So the critical technologies here is a battery management system. So when you, what is battery managing? So critical thing is balancing. You know, balancing means that when you connect the batteries in series, each batteries have uh, same state of charge. Each battery should be charged at the same amount. Otherwise, some batteries will end up, you know, with over discharging during charging, discharging, you know, uh, process. Some batteries may overcharge it during charging, you know, uh, process. So the balancing is a key thing. So I studied a lot about you know, battery management system. So we have our own battery management system technology, especially uh, optimized for second life batteries. That's one thing. And then we also studied a lot how we can estimate state of health quickly. So we get batteries from here and there, right? There are like 15 
20 you know, battery packs. And uh, in the battery pack, they actually have a lot of cells. Right? So we use cells, not the pack as is. So uh, we have to disassemble and figure out the state of health of each battery pack. So when we build this 300 kilowatt hour system, the system actually has 1,000 no, Nissan Leaf cells. 20 packs, 1,000 cells. So we actually charged and discharged every 1,000 cell one time to figure out capacity left over. It took three months. I don't want to do this for my business because <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. So we started how we can you know, quickly figure out state of health. Now we don't have to do that you know, stupid like full charge and discharge testing anymore. So we can figure out the state of health a lot faster than before. And uh, yeah, a lot of the system engineering to design and develop the uh, pack more efficient way. So right now our system is go, 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 appendix. Yeah, looks like this. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I can start a video. So uh, it's a lot more modular, meaning a, uh, previously we just build a small pack and connect them you know, as many as we need. But now we developed a kind of we have now kind of module. This is our like two kilowatt hour basing module consisted of six Nissan Leaf uh, modules. So this is, this is like, you know, double A batteries for us. If you want to increase the voltage, we just connect these things as many as possible, right? And then if you want to increase the current, we connect them in parallel, you know. So it makes us so uh, easy to build any size, any power, any uh, kind of capacity. Um, so, yeah, you can probably click the... Yeah. So one example is that we built a uh, 30 kilowatt hour. Does it work? Oh, this, this? Yep. Yeah. This is a one example of how we build a 30 kilowatt hour energy storage system. So it consisted of 15 basic modules. So battery packs, actually each module has its own slave uh, BMS installed. They're all the same. And this green thing is a master BMS which is communicating with our energy management you know, computer software. So, this is perfect site. We actually uh, decided to collaborate with one uh, company in Bay Area with that produces a, a, a solar charging system. So their current solar charging system doesn't have batteries. So whenever, whenever you know, so first when there, there's no car in the parking lot, their charger is, you know, doesn't do anything. They have they use solar panel. Uh, to charge the electric car, but without batteries, it doesn't really work efficient way. Over the weekend, nothing. Their solar production is just sent back to the grid. So they wanted us to build a uh, pack, just exactly like this. So we decided to pro provide uh, them with this uh, pack, probably as a first uh, commercial product. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so that's what we are doing. So we also uh, plan to work with other companies. One example is a, you know, the demand charge is a big concern for the big buildings. You know, during some specific you know, time period, uh, they are not supposed to use more than certain power. Uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, this storage can help them out, help them to cut their uh, peak demand, which is extremely uh, beneficial for the, to reduce their electricity bill. So uh, this is one example of 200 kilowatt hour system in a 10 foot container. So bigger system, we can also build like one megawatt hour system in a 20 foot container. So this is what we are doing and our plan. Um, yeah, I mean, that's basically <laughs> it. Any question? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. At what point do you think for residential solar systems mm -hmm. and small commercial where there are no demand charges, that storage will reach a point? So mm -hmm. with net metering, since the grid acts as a de facto mm -hmm. battery, mm -hmm. and you're being, in essence, credited at full retail rate, you know, less than retail rate. Um, mm -hmm. So at what point does storage make sense in a scenario where you have reliable electricity supply in like most of PGE territory? Mm -hmm. uh, well, it's... Uh, Mm, it's a good 
question. So first of all, our company is now focused on focusing on bigger system. It's because a bigger the system, more the efficient to build, and actually it's more cost effective. So we use container, for example, 20 feet container. We want to put as much as berries inside. They say that will make the system most cost effective. Right? But the, 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 the small system for the house, we actually never designed that. But I think uh, this will probably work well, the 30 kilowatt hour system, because a, uh, yeah, it's uh, probably too big for a single home. But about, I think a 15 kilowatt hour is the right size for the you know, average house with about two kilowatt solar panel. So that is basically from our uh, past experience with that small you know, storage system Why not here yeah and and um, I don't know it's uh <laughs> it's kind of difficult to answer I mean yeah. no I, but and the reason I ask is people all the time ask about because they're so storage of batteries especially PG and it's total BS mm -hmm. there's no there's relatively no need and there's no price of adequate financial benefit for it mm -hmm. but where you have demand charges Sense. Yes. So it's a way of complementing you say you're focused on the market yeah. and understanding how utilities work mm -hmm. at Sage versus if you were trying to sell the residential or create a mm -hmm. solution for them. Mm -hmm. We don't see the value. Yeah. yeah, residential system is, I don't know, I haven't analyzed their cost you know, analysis or stuff like that. It's probably, because I mean, the first thing is a uh, new systems are very expensive still. So they will. Probably depend on SG, you know, the SGIP. SGIP, yeah. Otherwise, yeah, it doesn't make sense. Still, the real cost of energy storage now is about like seven to eight hundred dollars per kilowatt hour. I'm not sure about the home system. Um, like Tesla claims that their power wall, power pack is about like five hundred dollars per kilowatt hour, but still, you cannot actually get the storage at that price. So um, our goal is, yeah, we, we, I think we can provide the storage at about $300 per kilowatt hour if it is storage, you know, uh, the, the built and installed in a <coughs> shipping container. So uh, yeah, we, uh, we are trying to move to a, a production stage. We are very still early. Uh, so before that, we probably want to do some uh, commercial demonstration. So do this basically the same thing, but they, that is on campus. We're not actually paying any electricity bill. <laughs> so we want to build a similar, but with a lot higher energy density and lower cost. And we'll install it at some commercial building to see how much we can actually save. And we have the real price. That will be about $300 per kilowatt hour. Um, how, how do you guarantee your lockup supply of that's a good question. Yeah. Um, we are very, we are in very close relationship with Nissan, and Nissan they let us know how many packs they have now. So that number is much more, you know, uh, than enough. That it's much more than we need for, like, say, if we even if we produce a few gigawatt hour per year, still that they have enough battery packs. So uh, we're not worrying about that, the supply, second life battery supply, but in the future, um, yeah, there'll be more companies who would you know, use the second life battery. So we are actually planning to uh, work with other uh, electric car manufacturer. For example, actually we, you know, the. Proterra is one known electric bus company. They approached us and uh, uh, to uh, to work together. So they, the electric bus battery is very attractive because they, the electric bus runs a lot more miles than you know regular car, and their standard industrial standard is for retirement is about 20% degradation. So their battery packs younger with higher state of health when they retire. So it's an amazing source of second life berries. And one another thing is a lot of cities in the United States, not just in the United States, all, all over the world, they committed to replace their old diesel buses with the electric you know, buses. So electric bus market will actually catch up the electric car market soon and will be, become bigger. 
So uh, I think it's a, uh, yeah. So we are, yeah, planning, yes. So how do you differentiate yourself from others that will get in the same market? Do you have IP or how do you protect oh. yourself from others that are going to use EC batteries also? Yeah, what we are doing, other people can do. Yeah, we, we don't have any silver bullet. We, we don't know anything like top, you know, secret, any like, but well, like it's the same thing with electric vehicle market. Tesla opened up their, you know, patent. Anybody can use Tesla's patent. We have our patent, you know, and we're actually preparing, but I don't think that can protect us from other, you know, uh, company. But what we are, uh, what we are, what I can say is that our real strength is actually a lot of experience in data. So we've done research on batteries for 10 years. So we know how, we, how to deal with the second life batteries. It's different. So new batteries, when you build up uh, energy storage using new batteries, because they are all same, all same condition. You don't have to worry about the variance. Right? But the second life varies. The state of health variance is kind of very uh, critical issue, and it, so because because of that, yeah, only there are not many people can actually handle that well. Uh, first, like mm, a few things is a yeah how to evaluate state of health quickly, and how to uh, kind of combine them and kind of organize them <coughs> in a pack. You know, uh, uh, in a safe way. And also another thing is that we experience a lot of battery fire. You know, storages catch fire. We had that kind of ex incident in our lab while testing batteries. So our another strength of the company is that we know how to suppress the battery fire. We invented that. That's one of our core pattern. So our BMS can detect the battery failure. When battery fails, so it's, it's known as a thermal run runaway. Right? Thermal runaway happens when two electrodes somehow short circuited internally. Then once that happens, they lose potential voltage and temperature starts to rise. So we can detect that definitely. And then once we detect that, we run our actuator to suppress the fire. So. Uh, yeah, this is why yeah, one of the kind of <laughs> interesting invention uh, we recently made. Uh, I would, pardon? I yeah. Would make sure you strengthen that argument when you, before you go on raising money. Yeah, yeah. Uh, raising fund is actually. Well, I've I've never done that. I have submitted a lot of research proposals. So I raise a lot of research fund, so that's kind of not that difficult for me anymore. But Raising fund for the company is totally different. So that's what we are actually struggling nowadays. <laughs> you need Chris on here. Uh, is there right? <laughs> is there anybody can help me? <laughs> yeah, so, but yeah, um, we're uh, doing very well. We're making great progress. Um, so uh, soon we'll, you know, we're still kind of campus company. <laughs> my lab is kind of still my company, but yeah, we are planning to mm, get out of the campus and start a, start our off-campus lab and factory. Yeah, so, and we are raising some funding. Uh. So lead-acid batteries, mm -hmm. you can just beat the snot out of them on how fast you can discharge them. Lithium-ion hasn't been. Mm -hmm. So forgiving mm -hmm. in what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I understand it's energy storage, but if you have to have high instantaneous power, mm -hmm. high discharge rate, mm -hmm. um, what do you do to put that capability in the system? Yeah, that's a good question too. So the systems we have developed so far are five-hour system because our peak time is five hours, four to nine. So that means our Charge in, discharge rate is typically 0.2 or lower. We even oversize the pack, so our discharge rate is so low. But uh, there are some 
other kind of storage, which is designed for kind of grid uh, flock, kind of uh, grid stabilization. They need high power. They may need, you know, very high uh, discharging rate. So in that case, lithium-ion batteries for the car can go up to, I think uh, my lab testing says up to 2C discharging is still safe. Second line batteries, degrade batteries, still can do 2C discharging. But that may not be enough. Uh, then we can use some other supplementary batteries like uh, super cap. Super cap is like something between capacitor and lithium-ion battery that can have much, much higher uh, discharge rate. So uh, we can probably build a, a hybrid system, battery and super cap together. So for a short time, high peak, you know, a high power uh, demand, we uh, use super cap. The super cap energy density is much lower than uh, mm -hmm. yeah, lithium ion battery. So yeah, that's, yeah, that, that's probably the answer. Yes, question. I know you changed your name from Renerage to purpose. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. So Randerich, uh was actually, so last year, the, we, were, we were still a four-man company. And we were a four-man company. Um, the four men last year were all engineers. Me, I'm just an engineer, right? And my student postdocs, they're all engineers. So uh, we thought that Randerich actually stands for renewable energy stories, you know? You know, words, batteries. You know, it doesn't really exist. But for us, okay, it's it's so easy to remember, and you know, sounds great. But you know, people hear the energy for the first time. First, they never pronounced it properly, <laughs> <laughs> and they never remember it. <laughs> so uh, this year, Ryan is our new member. He joined uh, last winter. He's a, he's not an engineer. He's like a business guy, so wow, he, uh, he changed a lot of things. <laughs> and especially, uh, he is super good at business model development and external relationships. So, okay, we, uh, I mean, I felt like I found a missing gear. Right? For engineers, like, okay, we can make something, design something, we're never gonna be able to sell it. Right? <laughs> so, uh, the Ryan, wow, he changed my company a lot. So the first thing he did is say, okay, we have to change the name. <laughs> Ranerich, what, what is Ranerich? <laughs> so, yeah, we purpose energy. It's so easy, you know, everybody remembers. So, wow, and after we changed this name, a lot of good things happening. <laughs> we won the competition, we got the grant, you know, we are approached by our VCs, investors. So, yeah, I didn't know that the name was that much important <laughs> for <laughs> business. So yeah. One of the rules in this game is when you're explaining, you're losing. So Renerage, you had to explain what it was, but repurpose it sort of like. Oh, okay. yeah. Yeah. And, um, so I can see at least that angle. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. All right. Any other questions? All right. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you.